<laughs> well, welcome and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Donito Burgess. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Tucson Audubon. Um, our presenter today is Patrick Maurice. Patrick's a birder and a nature photographer from Atlanta, Georgia. Patrick's been birding for as long as he can remember and carrying a camera with him for over a decade. Uh, while he's primarily a bird photographer, he also enjoys photographing nature as well as landscapes. Um, he's here. To, he's joined us today so he can talk about his travels and the birds he saw along the way in the United States, Ecuador, and Mexico in 2022. So I'd like to welcome Patrick. Um, but before we toss it over to Patrick, um, Gary Farber is here with Hunt's Photo. Um, Hunt's Photo is also um, basically helping us put all of these uh, these creative photography sessions on. We're really appreciative of, uh, of Hunt's help. Um, and Gary Farber is here with Hunts. Um, Gary, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself um, and go ahead and tell people a little bit about Hunts Photo. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, but I don't know. You can hear me, right? I don't know yeah, what my camera's, not working. My, my, my camera's no. not working. I have no idea why. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm with Hunts Photo and Video. Um, I'm going on my 30th year working for Hunts. Um, really, um, for those who don't know me, um, I, I've been uh, working in the photography industry and in, in the events for, for you know for a long time. Um, I'm really about building a really tight community with my customers, building relationship type thing, um, and really being there in the in the uh, in the birding community. So if you guys are ever looking for anything or need anything, you can reach out to me uh, by email. I'll put it down in the chat. You can reach out to me. I'm on social media as well as Facebook, Instagram. What I try to do with my social media page is not really make it about me, but I'd like to make it more about the community, sharing work with other photographers, um, giving tips, giving tips more about a community type thing and just featuring myself. Um, but Really, um, you know, if you need anything, reach out to me. It's, it's again, I can't stress more about a personalized service, personal touch, and building those relationships. That's more important to me than making a sale just to make a sale. Um, so reach out to me anytime. I think Patrick knows. Um, I'm accessible 24 to 7. So you can text me, email me, or anything you want, and I pretty much respond back. Sometimes within seconds, sometimes in and sometimes in 30 minutes or an hour thing. But I'm very responsive. So reach out to me on on, on anything you need and um. I'm honored to be part of Tucson Audubon Society. Um, I got connection with Luke at the San Diego Birding Festival about four, four or five years ago. And since then, we have built an incredible working relationship. And I look forward to coming back next year to the festival and continue these um, virtual programs. So thank you all very much and look forward to working with you guys in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, and with that, again, um, I'd like to toss it over to Patrick. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, real quick, before we get started, it's also I love reminding people of Tucson Audubon's mission, and we want to inspire people to enjoy and protect birds. And one of the ways we do that is through these types of virtual presentations. So again, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks, Patrick, for taking the time to do this. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Patrick. Awesome. So uh, before I start, I just want to say, like, yeah, I, I'm very humble and thankful for Gary for inviting me on and becoming part of this. Like I met him back in 2016, actually, at the North American Nature Photographers Association Youth Photography Camp in the Smokies. And so we met then. And then since then, I've basically all my camera gear I've gotten from Gary. And he brought me out to the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival this fall. So if anyone was there in Tucson in August, I was there leading trips. Um, and that was great. So and that's how I met Donita, too. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. And so let's see. The way that this my presentation works is normally I'm giving it in person. Um, and so I have and I like to be in, engaged and interactive with my presentation. So I want to show like what I'm seeing and ask audience questions. But because this is on Zoom, what I want to do is I'll have my ID quizzes still, but I'll just ask that you uh, take a look. I'll give you guys a few seconds, a minute or so to try to ID the birds that I have photographed. And then you can uh, we can talk about it at the end of the presentation. So with all that being said, let's get started. So going back, rewind the clock, uh, 20, 23 months or so to January 2022 and the start of my birding big year. So I started off in Wisconsin. I was there 
in Madison, Wisconsin, where with my grandmothers and grandparents for for the for Christmas. And so start off with this interesting swan here with the yellow bill. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Basically, that swan is a a whooper swan. So it's a rare swan that shouldn't be in Wisconsin. They're a Eurasian species. Um, and this bird, we don't know if it was wild or not. It was, it didn't have any bands on the legs. The wings looked fine. Um, but, you know, with waterfowl, there is always a question of provenance when you have rarities that show up like that mandarin junk duck in, in New York City and Central Park. So I don't think this bird officially counted, but it was a fun way to start off January 1st in Wisconsin. And then a few days later, I went to a completely different environment. So I left... I left the cold, gray, and snowy Wisconsin to the lush green cloud forest of Maki Paguna Reserve and Eco Lodge in Ecuador. Um, so how I got to Maki is I have a my an ornithology advisor. Okay, so there's a. I hope this is enough. There's a. Let's see. Um, is everything okay? I just heard some talking in the background. Yeah, yeah, there was just someone unmuted. I, I took care of it. Sorry about that. The screen, sorry to interrupt, but the screen is um, not showing the whole screen. It's showing uh, stuff on the right-hand side. You can't you you can't see the photographer. Okay. Yeah, it did say pause for a second. Let's see. And while we're on the uh, subject, we did not see the whooper frame. Oh, okay. It was not visible let's go back to that then yeah zoom we're just seeing changing. the whole no. okay i see it right there in front so yep i can see it now okay great and then i'd like to pull up my presenter view if zoom will let me all right but now it paused the sharing. So I'm just gonna, I guess not do presenter view. Yeah, Patrick, it seems like at least on our end, I don't know, it's, it's probably tough for you to know, but yeah, you're right. As soon as you put it into presenter view, it basically freezes on our end. Okay, gotcha. Uh, well, that's okay, I, I know my presentation, so. Sorry about that. Let's get back. So this is Wisconsin. We got the whooper swan in the middle with the yellow bill. And I don't know, can you see the mouse as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I can point that out yeah. with the mouse. Okay, awesome. So after that, I went to the, the tropical rainforest of Maki Paguna in Ecuador. Everyone see this slide? Is that working well? Yeah, that's working great. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I, I went to Maki because I wanted to spend some time birding in South America. I am a bird and nature guide, so I wanted to experience a new country and get some training into becoming a guide. And so when I told this to my ornithology professor at, at University of Georgia, where I went to school, he recommended Maki Picuna because uh, the lodge owners, Rebecca and Rodrigo, Rodrigo, Rebecca came to UGA to do her PhD and she actually worked with Dr. Cooper, my advisor. And so he immediately said, go to Maki, like I have a great relationship. And so we set it up and she took me on and let me stay there for three months, which was the length of the tourist visa. So I spent early January from January 6th to uh, April 5th in, in Ecuador, 90 days. And most of that time was spent at Maki Bikuna, basically just helping out um, and, and burning, which was really great. So some pictures from my life at Maki. We have it's a rainforest, so there's amazing biodiversity and plants everywhere. There's bromeliads, there's epiphytes, all of this all over the place. Um, and I have a particular fondness of ferns, so I took that fern photo. And then the chefs there were all amazing, great food. Um, it's an open air reserve, like lodge and reserve, and there's a ton of cool birds, but uh, they're also known for spectacled bears. So when I was there, it was the rainy season. So early spring up here is the rainy season in Ecuador. And so basically it rained like every day. That's why you can see the rain boots. 
in the background of the photo uh, with Monty the Monty the dog, the golden retriever. And in the dry season, which is our fall, they are they have spectacled bears that come down from the highlands and they come to Maki to feed on the fruiting avocado trees. And so they will climb these trees to feed on the avocado fruit. And so unfortunately I didn't get to see any bears because I was there at the wrong time of year, but I was I was just in Ecuador a few days ago, like Donita mentioned, and I actually met up with Isabel, uh, the daughter of Rebecca and Rodrigo, and she works with Maki as well. And she said that this year has been great for respectable bear sightings. She said they'd seen, they had 155 observations so far this fall season. Um, so I'm hoping I can go down to their dry season and see some bears sometime. And so another thing that I did while at Maki Pacuna, on my first day of birding in the morning, I noticed with the local guide that there were some tiny hawks and they were building a nest not far from the lodge. And so the tiny hawk is a rare species of exhibitor. So it's related to like coopers and sharp shinned hawks in the US and goshawk, but they're incredibly small and their behavior and, and uh, just being seen observed in the wild is very rare. So when we found this nest, I let a scientist know that worked with Maki and he said that I should go out and observe it, try to do it every day for about an hour and just to make notes and observations because uh, they've rarely observed active nests of the species before. And so that was a really fun project for me to do. And unfortunately, so we actually, because we we're so interested, we got game cameras. And when I left Maki, we, set, we were setting up just before I left and basically we wanted to record uh, the eggs hatching and growth and parents feeding. But unfortunately, the the climber, when she set up the game camera, she hadn't worked with cameras before and something happened. And I, I tried to find out what happened with the videos, but it sounded like somehow they didn't get re recorded. Their card got corrupted, unfortunately, um, which is a bummer. But in my time of observation, so when I started out, when I first came to Maki in early January, uh, I noticed the hawks were bringing sticks to the nest and building the nest. And by the time I left the nest, uh, I'd seen uh, the, uh, the behavior of all from incubating eggs to starting to bring uh, birds and like golden tanagers to the nest because tiny hawks are exhibitors, so they hunt birds. And because they're smaller, they actually will hunt hummingbirds too, uh, which is pretty incredible. So yeah, that was a really fun project to do while there. And another one of my tasks while at Maki was to feed the hummingbirds. And so because this is South America and Ecuador, there are tons of hummingbird species at Maki. And so I would feed them and get up early every morning and feed them again at lunchtime. And they take probably over a gallon of sugar water uh, each feeding. So over two to three gallons a day of sugar water we were going through to feed all these hummingbirds. And so there's four species of hummingbirds in this photo. But in my time at Maki, these were all hummingbird species I photographed while I was at the lodge and most of them came to the feeders there were a couple like the booted racket racket tail up here in the top right corner that didn't come to the bird feeders and the purple crown fairy here in the middle left but all these other hummingbirds were observed coming to the feeders at, at Maki Pagina which is really really special and one of my favorite photos that I took while I was at Maki of a hummingbird was the green crown brilliant uh, this is a nice adult bird that perched for a, a few moments after drinking at the feeder. And they're really fun to see a large, large hummingbird found in the tropics. And Maki, of course, so this is Ecuador, you know, there's tons of birds near the equator, hundreds of species. And in, in the tropics, you'll get lots of tanagers. And so this is just a collection of tanager photos that I took while I was at Maki Picuna, ranging from the common blue-gray tanager in the top middle to the bay-headed tanager top left corner or the blue-headed tanager on the top right. And this golden tanager on the left side, this is one bird that I saw a tiny hawk carried to the, to the nest while I was watching it, which is pretty cool. And then when you're in the tropics, you know, it's not just fun hummingbirds and flashy tanagers. There's also what we call LBJs, which are little brown jobs. And so these are birds that are a little bit tougher to identify, but still really cool to see and, and unique. And they're all lifers for me, which was fun. We had birds like the Xenops in the middle. I think it was the streak Xenops. 
and lots of wood creepers and foliage cleaners and stuff like that. And then there are warblers there as well. So this is a cool slide because it shows warblers that are from North America that breed in North America, like the black burning warbler on the left side. And then there's warblers of the uh, South and Central America, like the three striped warbler that are at Maki Picuna year round. And then there's species like tropical perula that are also year round in South America, but they extend North all the way up to Texas and will breed in Texas as well and can be seen in the ABA area. So it's cool to see that whole mixture of warblers all in the same place. And another awesome species that you can find at Maki Picuna is a torrent duck. So uh, the way Maki Picuna is set up is there's a river that's right in front of the entrance. So you have to cross the bridge at the gate and the river is like inside the property of Maki Picuna. And so you can be on the bridge in Maki and basically every morning I would see these torrent ducks and there's a pair there with, with a young bird. And so the pair, they're sexually dimorphic, which means they're different plumages by sex. So the male is this bird on the left with the striking black and white plumage and red bill. And the female has the gray, gray mantle, gray back and tail, and they're like ruddy orange underside. And so it's fun to sit there and watch the torrent ducks. Have you seen birds like the harlequin ducks in the AVA area? They they're very similar in that they both live in fast, fast flowing streams. They breed on that area and they love the rapids. Um, but with harlequin ducks in North America, they they breed up in those mountain streams in the winter on the coast while torrent ducks are around the mountain streams year round. Uh, but there aren't just water birds and songbirds at Maki. There's also raptors as well. And so there's just a collection of different species of raptors I saw. But Maki Bakuna, there's the large black and chestnut eagle on the right, which is I only saw it once. It was a rare sighting. And then birds like the roadside hawk on the bottom left that are more common in the tropics and will occasionally show up in the ABA area. And then, of course, there's toucans. You know, it's the tropics. I couldn't include a uh, presentation on birding in the tropics without some toucan photos. So these are all types of toucans. They're all in the same family, but you can see uh, they range from largest on the left to smallest. We have the choco toucan, a larger toucan, this classic yellow and black colors, and then a colored arasari in the middle and a crimson rumped toucanet, which is all green with uh, some bright colors near the face. And then another photo of a cool species that were residents at Maki and were very common is the Rufus Mot Mot. Uh, these are really cool birds that are found throughout the tropics and they're really bright, brilliant colors, super striking in plumage. And this is a bird that, because it's open air in the lodge, occasionally I would be sitting in the lodge and I'd see a Mot Mot fly onto the per and perch on the railing right next to me. It might sit there, check me out, or looking for moths or something attracted to the lights and then fly off to a nearby branch. And so I was really happy to get some nice photos of this bird. And then Maki also has Quetzals and Trogans. So if you're in Southeast Arizona, you may have seen the elegant Trogans down in Madeira Canyon or a place like that. Uh, the collared Trogan here on the right, it's a similar species and looks, but it's found in the tropics and doesn't range as far north as as the US. And then if you've been to a place like Costa Rica or Guatemala, you may have heard of seeing Quetzals, like the resplendent Quetzal. And the golden-headed Quetzal you can see is similar, but they lack the long trail tail streamers that you'll find in resplendent Quetzals. But it's still really cool to see. Uh, it's such a brilliant looking bird. And yeah, you know, Quetzals and Trogans, seeing those on a day is never a guarantee. So it was fun to find. And so after about a month of my time at Maki Bakuna, I did a little birding trip with Naturescape Tours and Kim Risen, who runs that company. And so we did this trip. It was me in the middle, my mom on the right, her boyfriend, Dan, and then uh, Charlie Boswick on the left, another Atlanta birder. So it was a small group of Atlanta birders and then a local guide, O'Hare, on the left. And we went through northern Ecuador, I think it was about 10 or 12 days and hit a variety of spots. We even went to Maki and had about 365 species in those in that time. So, so here's some photos from the birding trip. Uh, we have on the left birding at Antisan at high elevations in the cold. In the middle, this was I think a San Isidro or Wild Sumaco Lodge. 
It's a selfie. And if you see right here where I'm circling, that's a trogan sitting on the railing, waiting to, for insects to catch from the moth light, moth sheet. And then over here is just a scene of birding in the tropics of Ecuador and what you can expect. It's, it's beautiful out there. Um, and there's so many birds. It's, it's amazing. So here's a couple of highlight photos that I took on this trip that I wanted to share with you, you all. So on the left, there's a rainbow bearded thornbill, which is a hummingbird I'd never heard about before going to Ecuador. I, it was not on my radar at all, but this was seen in the high elevations in Antisana National Park. And as you can see, their gorget goes down the throat and also up in the crown. And depending on the way the light hits it, you can get a rainbow of colors on that gorget, which is really incredible. And then on the right, we have my top hummingbird target of the trip, which is sword-billed hummingbird. And these are the hummingbirds with a bill that's about the same length as the body, which is just crazy. So the way they feed, they, they have a special flower they adapted to, but you can see them at hummingbird feeders too. And they are normally hovering to feed on the feeders because they can't perch on that feeder and dip their huge bill into the into the nectar. But sometimes there's places I've seen photos where a hummingbird perch is set up so a sore bill can perch on top and stick its bill down to drink from the sugar water. Another really cool hummingbird that was on my list that I wanted to see is the shining sunbeam. And so this hummingbird doesn't have like a bright gorget like you see in the left photo. Instead, the bright colors are on the back of the bird. And it's usually a pink with some gold tones and lower down. And if the light hits it just right, you'll get that color. So you can see in the photo on the left, you don't have that color. It's all about the sunlight, which is really cool with hummingbirds. Uh, so this is another photo that I really like that I took at Paz de las Aves. And this is the blue-winged mountain tanager. And you see it's taken during the rain. So it's because it's rainy season, it still rained on us most days. Uh, but in Ecuador, like during the raising season and like at Maki Picuna, it's not raining like all day, every day. Like normally uh, the way the rain works is in the morning, it starts out maybe a little cloudy. Um, but not raining and sunny. And then in the afternoon, the clouds start to build kind of like the monsoons in Arizona and then no rain throughout the afternoon. And usually by the evening, the rain stops. And so it's it's pretty moist, but it's not like 24 seven rain, which is nice. And then over here, we have this photo that I really like of this black banded owl. And the, what this owl was doing, how I photographed it is it was coming to a moth sheet and so moth sheets are set up at lots of lodges to, they're set up overnight. So it's a white sheet with a bright light shining on it all night. And so it attracts moths and other insects that come to the sheet. And so researchers may come out to study them, but also it's a perfect bird feeder. And so at night you might get species like black banded owls coming in, hunting the insects and grabbing them from the sheet. And then early morning, we would usually go check out these sheets to see the leftover insects that were still there and the songbirds that would come in to pick off those insects. So that was really interesting to see and photograph as well. And then in the middle, there's a chestnut wing sing pods that's up in the mountains at Antisana National Park. And then I call this photo on the right a Perito Blanco, which just means little white dog or a little white puppy. Uh, this is a mountain avocet bill. So this is actually a very rare hummingbird in Ecuador. They're hard to find. They don't usually come to feeders, but there had been one coming to Guango Lodge, which is one of the lodges we stayed at on the trip with Naturescape. And the cool thing about this hummingbird is that they're like a flower piercer. So they're called an avocet bill because the lower mandible is recurved. So it curves upwards. And the way they feed at, at flowers is they don't stick their bill into the center of the flower to feed on the nectar. Instead, they pierce the flower to drink the nectar um, like flower pierces do. So it's really interesting in a unique way that this hummingbird evolved to, to feed. And then another really awesome hummingbird in Ecuador was the violet-tailed sylph, which has this really long tail. And in the right light, it just glows purple and violet. It's incredible to see. And 
they like to land and flash their wings and tail spread it out to kind of ward off other hummingbirds and so it's fun to see and, and try to take pictures of that and then just like that the 90 days were up my three months in ecuador and i flew back to atlanta and to the states in early april so i got back and spring migration was already out already on like incredibly there was a wilson's warbler that was found in atlanta in early april and normally these birds aren't coming through until late April, but this bird, for some reason, either it was wintering uh, closer to us, like maybe in Florida, or just decided to come up early. So it came back to, to Georgia early and on its way north and was able to go see this bird at a local park in Atlanta. And then in mid-April, I went down to South Florida to hang out with my friend Skylar, Skylar Bull, and we worked together in Montana uh, in the summer of 2021, and he was working at the Archbold Biological Station in Florida uh, with Florida Scrub Jays in, in spring of 2022. So I met up with him at Archbold. You can see in this photo on the left, it's I'm holding a peanut with a Florida Scrub Jay in my hand, and they, like, they actually feed the Jays at Archbold to study them. And so they were quite trained to come and land on your hand when you offered it up to them. And then we decided to make a trip down to the Dry Tortugas National Park, uh, way south of the Florida Keys, uh, because if you're a ABA birder, you'll know there are specialties down there that are easiest to find there than anywhere else. So species like Black Knotty, Mask Booby, um, Brown Knotty, Antillian Nighthawk, and stuff like that were all down at Dry Tortugas and we were looking for. So I've got a couple of photos from that. And this is actually the first ID quiz of uh, the presentation. So you can see there's a photo on the left and on the right. And I'll let you take some time to see if you can ID these two birds that I saw while I was at the Dry Tortugas. Um, and in the background, you can see this is a photo of the fort and there's lots of magnificent frigate birds that are flying around the fort all the time, which is really fun to see. Uh, and I'll note that on the left, there's two bird species in that photo. Okay. So in the third week of April, I did another Georgia big day with my team, uh, John Mark Simmons, John Patton Moss, and Josiah Lavender. And so we did a big day. I've been doing a big day in Georgia the past few springs. And in 2021, we actually set the record for Georgia uh, with 196 species, which is so close to 200. And so we're, we're trying to break 200, which is hard. We need everything to, to line up perfectly. And so we tried again uh, last year. And unfortunately, we came up pretty short of our previous total and record. But we decided to add a fundraising component this time just because uh, when I first started doing big days, it was for the youth birding competition in Georgia. And those big days always had a fundraising component. And it was great fun to raise as much money as we could, like either based on like a per species amount or a certain amount, and then give it to conservation. And so we wanted to do that and continue that tradition. So we decided to donate uh, the money we raised, which was over $3,500 to the young birders going to the Rio de Abo Young Birding Camp in Texas, which is pretty neat. And then, as you can see, I was, I'm constantly moving. So after experiencing spring migration in Georgia, I decided to continue it and do it again in Ohio at the Biggest Week. And so I've been going to the Biggest Week and guiding there since 2019. And it was canceled in 2020 because of COVID and virtual in 2021. So this was 2022 was the first time back for all the other guys that had been going to the Biggest Week for several years. And so... It's a great birding festival. It's 10 days. That's why it's called the biggest week because it's longer than a week. And you can see hundreds of species of birds. Like if you are there the whole festival and birding hard, you can see over 200 species. There's songbirds coming through and uh, waterfowl and shorebirds and gulls and ducks. And the great thing about it is that a lot of them are coming through when, with the songbirds, especially when the leaf out is just starting, as you can see here. So it's not like in Georgia, I'm used to birding and spring migration and the leaves are fully out 
and it's a lot harder to find these songbirds at the top of the trees. But here at the biggest week, the leaves are just starting. So it's a lot easier to see the birds, especially here at Maggie Marsh, which is famous, the boardwalk here. You have all these smaller trees that are just starting up with green leaves. And so the songbirds were off, will often be feeding on these leaves right off the boardwalk. And I've seen like several species of warblers landing on the boardwalk right next to you. They don't care. They're they're hungry. This is situated on the shores of Lake Erie, so up in uh, northwestern Ohio. And so the birds are refueling there at in the area, and then they're going to cross Lake Erie to continue north to their breeding grounds. So here's just a few photos from the biggest week. And just as an example, like this magnolia warbler, this photo is completely uncropped, like taken right off the boardwalk, like almost couldn't get, I couldn't get the whole bird in focus at the aperture I was shooting because of how close it was to me. And, you know, it's a brilliant spring male magnolia warbler. It's just awesome to be out there and see all these birds. And it's not just the good birding. There's tons of great people. There's usually a good crew of young birders that are out there uh, leading trips for the festival. And we all have our yellow caps on. You can know if you're birding with a guide or if you have a question for a guide, you'll find them with the yellow Biggest Week hat. And then I met Tiffany Kirsten. Uh, she was a keynote speaker last year and she had just completed her lower 48 big year in 2021 and set the record for that. And then there's other uh, great birders and friends on the right. Uh, that we were burning together at the end of the festival. Uh, so this is a little fun equation I made from Biggest Week Birding. You've got early morning birding with a bay-breasted warbler on the left side, and then you can take a little lunch break and go to Barnside Creamery, which is about five minutes away. Incredible food and ice cream, super close, and then you can get back on the boardwalk in the afternoon and see birds like this hybrid blue-winged and golden-winged warbler. Uh, and a nice flowering tree just off the boardwalk. And then, you know, the biggest week ended. It wrapped up in mid-May. And about 10 days later, I was off to Alaska. Uh, and this is another tour with Naturescape Tours and Kim Risen here on the bottom right corner. And it was a tour that was organized with other Atlanta birders and my mom and Dan. And we did the the classic large tour where we started off in Anchorage and we went down to Seward for uh, pelagic birds and the bay. And then we also went to Nome and Gamble and Utgyakvik. So we'll see photos from that. So we began the trip in Nome after landing in Anchorage. And Nome has got musk oxen and uh, my first Alaskan lifer on the first day. So another pause a moment that this bird was seen uh, flying around near the Bay of Nome. And I'll let you try to figure that out for a second. And so this is a cool, really cool species that breeds up in Nome. And so the reason you go to Alaska in the summer to see all the breeders, and if you're there at the time of year that I was there, at the end of May, early June, you can also try to see Asian vagrants that were taking part in their spring migration that either took a wrong turn or were blown by the winds and uh, left Russia and flew over to Alaska. So these are some more photos from Nome that were all taken with my iPhone. We got a view from Council Road, one of the birding roads you go on in Nome, a rock ptarmigan that I phone scoped and a cheer falcon on a nest. That's what I also phone scoped. And then after a day or two in Nome, we went out to gamble and so Gamble is a small town on St. Lawrence Island, and it's this island is in between Russia and Alaska, and it's actually closer to Russia, but it's still part of Alaska. So like on a clear day, which as you can see with the clouds, it didn't happen much when we were there, but on a clear day, you can actually see Russia. So we had a couple clear days where you could see Russia on the other side. But birders come to Gamble to look for rarities because of because of its remoteness, because it's so far away because it's isolated in the ocean if there's any songbird or other bird that's migrating through and they get blown off course and over the ocean they're not going to want to land on open water uh, so they'll seek shelter and refuge and they'll go to a place like gamble uh, to rest and refuel and hopefully make it back to wherever they're going and so as you can see in this second photo from the left when you're birding and gamble there's what we call it's this is the bone yards and basically the native population has been there for, for a very long time. 
and they would dump their bo their bones in different piles and then their bones and ivory and stuff like that would fossilize and so the more recently natives have come through and would dig in these holes to try to find ivory and other uh cool fossils to sell to locals or birders or guests uh, to make some extra money so what these holes also did was provide shelter and refuge for songbirds like this brambling here because there's no trees on gamble there's no trees this far north so they're going to fly and they're going to seek shelter and they're going to land in these on the edges of these uh, boneyard pits and so when you're birding in there you have to watch your step and we try to walk in lines like you're flushing a rail or sparrow to try to uh, flush up any rare songbirds and see what we could find but um our time in gamble was very chilly and gray uh and dreary unfortunately like with the way the weather was uh, we were socked in with fog most days and actually we were on gamble longer than planned because of the fog was so bad the planes couldn't land and pick us up and so we were there longer but you know we still saw some great birds we had these long billed dowchers in the bottom right and then there are there are hundreds of thousands probably millions of crested auklets that breed on the mountainside that you'll see in a couple slides and um they feed out in the ocean during the day and then come back to feed their young and then while I gamble, though, I would call this my best find of the year. I, I gave the idea to Ross's gull. And so these are a really hard to find gull, one of the hardest in North America. And they're best found in, in North America and Alaska, uh, where they will breed and on like the far pack ice and tundra and these remote areas. But this bird came by, just came out of the fog and it actually circled our group, checked us out. I was able to get this photo and some other ones. And it was really exciting, like it was unexpected, you know, one of those magic moments of just being in the right place, the right time. And it was actually really cool because Kim, uh, who was our guide with, Na with Naturescape Tours, he had never seen a Ross's gull. It was one of his, I think he only had one or two gulls left in North America that he hadn't seen. And Ross's was one of them. So to be able to find that bird for Kim uh, was really exciting. And he was he was jumping, jumping up and down like a child. It was, it was really great. Really fun to see and find and share that moment with him. And so we finally had a sunny day near the end of our trip. And so I took this selfie and these evening photos at midnight because at, when you're that far, far north in Alaska in the summer, the sun doesn't set. It gets low on the horizon and then it just goes back up. So it was really fun to see and witness that and just have the great golden hour lasting long at you know, midnight, 11, 11 p.m., 1 a.m., which is really fun and cool to see. And you can see in the top right photo, like just beyond the, the line of clouds, that's the mountain that I was talking about where the millions of seabirds nest. And then on the day we left Gamble, we had another sunny day. And just before we were leaving, uh, we found, we were, we were alerted by other birding groups that are on the end of this bird. Uh, this swallow here and it was a rarity it's a I'll give you a hint that it's a AVA code for rarity that we saw while we were there and it was unexpected but really cool to to get that bird and just you know to find something like that on gamble that's why birders go there for those exceptional rarities that can show up and then I boarded the our prop plane and headed off off the island and back to to Nome and so when we got back to Nome we our trip was a little changed but we we Kim was able to maximize our time in Nome, and give, in Nome and give us some more time so we went on the bristle-thighed curlew hike and saw those birds and then we were able to see blue throats and the arctic warblers that breed there as well which is really fun and then after Nome we went to Seward and we did the little seabird, seward, seabird cruise. And then after that, we went to Utkjakvik, which uh, used to be called Barrow. Utkjakvik is the native name for it. And this is the farthest north town in, in North America. It's way at the top of Alaska. And there's tons. It's, a, it's just a tundra landscape with tons of really cool birds. And it was funny. Uh, there's great birders that are also going there on their tours. And so in the middle, I, I ran into Tyler Ficker who is actually an Ohio birder that works with the biggest week and 
guys with saber wing nature tours and we've been friends since we started joining the biggest week together in 2019 and then i ran into a couple friends as well there's tom johnson on the right and ryan zucker in the middle that i knew previously as well and so you can see the the gnome sign uh their welcome means pa is pagla pagla givisi and uh, the name Ukviakvik actually translates to the place where we hunt snowy owls. Um, and so there are there are snowy owls there, but they don't like hunt them all the time. So it's more of a sober, like traditional ceremonial event, but it's not, I, I don't think the population up there in, in Ukviakvik is in danger of going extinct or anything like that. And they're, they're a very special bird. And the, the locals there know the importance of those to to the landscape and to the birders that are visiting Utkiakvik. And we also got to see polar bear while we were in up in Utkiakvik, which was completely unexpected, not a not a species that I had on my radar, but you know, it's one of those incredible uh mammals that are up there in Utkiakvik and at the right time of year, if you're there in the summertime and if there's the sea ice is closed and stuff like that. You have, you may have a chance to see these polar bears. And the reason we actually saw them is because the locals had done a hunt recently and they left the scraps that they didn't want on the sea ice, on the pack ice. And so the polar bears were coming in near the town to feed on that scrap meat. But the breeding birds are what you're really at Ukiakvik for. So they've got incredible breeders like the snowy owl, like I already mentioned, and then species like the snow bunting here in the top right. We have a pair of red foul ropes here on the bottom right. And this is a breeding female on the left, the brighter bird and foul ropes. They're sexually dimorphic, but the females are brighter while the males like this bird on the right are duller. And so their, their, their sexual roles are reversed and that with foul ropes, the females will go and breed with multiple males and then the males will go back and tend the nest and raise young while the females are off. So it's kind of interesting that they have that flip sexual uh, uh, dimorphism and and roles compared to other songbirds and birds in the in the world. Then on the left, we have a nice salmon skull and breeding plumage and some dunlin and then yodeling long-tailed ducks in the top left, which is really fun to see in here. And if you haven't heard the yodel of the long-tailed duck, I highly recommend checking it out after this presentation. And so here's another group selfie from Utkiakvik. And I uh, just want to point the polar bear in the background right here. Uh, this is the iPhone scope photo of it. So that was kind of fun to take a photo with the, with the polar bear. And then after Alaska, I was back home for a few weeks or so and then went out to Colorado at the end of June for a family reunion and did a little birding, not ton, but I, I met up with Ted Floyd, a good birding friend of mine, and he's an editor for the American Birding Association. And we did some birding together and saw the Swainson's hawk and American three-toed woodpecker, which were nice year birds to add. And then after that, I actually went to Camp Colorado in mid-July. And at Camp Colorado, it's a young birding camp that's run by the American Birding Association. And I'd been to the camp as a camper in 2013 and also in 2016, but this year I was the intern. And so I, I helped out with the leaders and I showed them the birds and everything like that. So there's Stellar's J, American Dipper, and some crossbills in this photo. Some more scenes from the camp. We, you know, we bird the high elevation tundra and see ptarmigan and then lower elevations like the dry pawnee grasslands and seabirds like, uh, thick build long spurs and chestnut card long spurs and stuff like that. And then I've got another ID quiz here. Uh, this was seen at Pawnee Grasslands. And it's a little tricky, but uh, if you look at the structure and shape of the bird, you might be able to figure this one out. Okay. So after that, I worked in Cape May in the fall of 2022 as an interpretive naturalist. And so I worked at the Hawk Watch primarily, but we worked at the different count sites. And basically I really enjoyed the job because we weren't focused on counting the birds as much as more about interpretive education and pointing out 
birds and wildlife and other, and everything else we were seeing to the public that were visiting and other birders. And so I've got a lot of photos from my time in Cape May. And so we worked at the different count sites. And one of the count sites we did was the morning flight site at Higby Beach, WMA. And basically morning flight is when with, with most birds that, that are migrating, songbirds migrate at night primarily because they want to avoid the raptors and fiercer winds during the day. And so they use the stars commonly to navigate. And a lot of times, and with places like Cape May, when the birds are migrating overnight, in the morning when the sun comes up, they might find themselves over open water of the ocean. And so a lot of them will circle back around and head back north into New Jersey to um, find a place to rest for the day and refuel. And so at Higby Beach, you can get counts of tens of thousands of songbirds passing through as they're reorienting. And so this is just a, a photo of multiple different species of birds here. Uh, and you can try to identify those that were all seen uh, migrating by in the early mornings in Cape May. But most of my time was spent at the Hawk Watch, uh, which I really enjoyed because it's not just raptors you're seeing, you know, you also get morning flights there of songbirds, but, uh, and water birds at Bunker Pond. But the great thing about the Hawk Watch is that the raptors are easier to see, they're larger, and some will pass by really close. So, these are all raptor photos, another little ID quiz that I made uh, that I took in Cape May. Most of them were at the Hawk Watch. Um, the peregrine falcons were taken at Sea Watch in Avalon. But you get hundreds of raptors and other birds passing through Cape May. It's a really great spot to watch migration and see it unfold. Uh, so I would highly recommend a visit to Cape May in southern New Jersey if you haven't been there yet. Uh, so this is one of my favorite photos from the Hawk Watch. This is a Merlin. Uh, and the cool thing about this photo is that it's got a full crop here, which means that it's ate food while migrating. It also has a dragonfly in its talons. So a very successful hunter that is migrating, has already eaten, is, has enough food to last for its next meal, and then has another meal on the wing ready for it. Really the definition of fast food. And then I've got some other photos from my time in Cape May that were just cool to see. We got to see, you know, had to include a Cape May warbler because I was in Cape May, of course. And then there were, there's also large numbers of monarchs that are migrating through. And so occasionally you'll see a roost site where hundreds of monarchs will rest for the evening and they'll look like the trees in Mexico, but at a smaller scale with all these butterflies right next to each other. And then on the top left, this is a Kirtland's warbler, which showed up. Uh, and two actually showed up that on the same day, and these were first state record birds. And so everyone in Cape May went over to chase them and see them, and this one was quite obliging. And another really fun thing I did in Cape May is called NOCVISBIG, which is short for Nocturnal Visible Migration. And basically, like I mentioned with the songbirds that are migrating at night, now with the technology we have, we have thermal scopes that the public can buy and high powered flashlights. And so when we saw that the setup looked good for a good migration night, we would turn on the thermal scopes and watch the sky and actually see birds migrating over. So we would usually start at the Hawk Watch and you could see lift off in the evening of, of water birds. Like we saw large flights of American bitterns lifting out of the marsh and night herons. And then later you get songbirds and other really interesting birds. So I took some photos from that. Of course, they're not the best because it's really hard to photograph birds at night. You need a high ISO, a good a good camera, and a high enough shutter seed to frame them uh, to freeze the birds. But uh, you can ID all of these birds to species just based on these lower quality photos. Uh, so I'll leave the slide up for a few seconds for folks to see if they can ID all the different species that are in this photo from a good migration night or a couple of migration nights in Cape May. And then I had, we had this bird on a really good migration night in October in Cape May that was completely unexpected. Everyone, we actually didn't ID the species 100% when we saw it because it was so off the radar. Uh, this bird is a yellow rail. And so you can actually see a little bit of the yellow in the, in the secondaries, but this is a species that I don't think has ever before been recorded 
and being seen in nocturnal migration. And it was a rarity in, in New Jersey. They're a hard to find cryptic species. Usually the best way to find them is to see them either at the Yellow Rail and Rice Festival in Louisiana in the fall or like on their breeding grounds in a place like Minnesota. Um, but they're sticks to the marsh. They're small. They're sparrow sized rails. And they're even, I've heard like you can stand in a marsh and have them calling right around you or within a few feet of you at your feet. And they blend in so well, and they're they're so easy to to hide in the grass that you can't see the bird. So to see one passing over and to get on it and get photos and confirm it uh, was incredible, super special, and like it was really just an incredible encounter experience that I'll remember forever. And then the last site that I worked at as a naturalist was the Sea Watch at Avalon, and so this is a site where. There are hundreds of thousands of birds, mostly water birds that are passing through uh, and they're passing by Cape May heading south to their wintering grounds. And the reason why the Avalon Sea Watch is set up where it is, is because Avalon sticks out. It's, it's north of like the main sites in Cape May and it's at Avalon because it sticks out a mile further and further into the ocean to, to the Atlantic than the surrounding areas in New Jersey. So the birds that are passing by Avalon are much closer to Avalon than they would be to, to the Cape, to the Cape May, like Coral Avenue, a place like that. And so the sea watcher sits in front of his shack and they stand there all day. It's a grueling job. They're there, sunrise to sunset. Every, and they're there six days a week, counting every bird that goes by with clickers. And sometimes they have flights of 50,000 birds that will go by. So it's an incredible, uh, grueling job, but you see some really cool flights. So there's lots of parasitic Jaegers that are seen off the beach, huge flocks of scoters when they come through in October. And then you might get songbirds like this black-footed green warbler that will land on the beach. So this is a tired migrant bird in an early morning when I was at Avalon one day. And then I also got to help out with raptor banding. So I went to raptor banding. Uh, they have a couple stations because they have a project to ban raptors and determine more information on their biometrics and also to just, uh, if they recapture the bird, they can get more information on like lifespan and and learn more about the species. And so I was invited out a couple of times while I, was, while I was working in Cape May and got to hold a couple of raptors, release them. And raptor banding is, is really cool. It's a, it's like fishing for raptors. So it's, it's really fun. It's not an experience I've done multiple times, but I got to do it when I was in Hawk Mountain in the previous fall. So I was invited out last fall. It was a good time. And then after Cape May wrapped up, the season ended after only, it was only a short season. It's about two months of work in the fall, uh, September and October. And then in early November, I left Cape May and was heading back to Atlanta. But I took the long way home by doing a little short stop at Hawk Mountain, which is, as I mentioned before, is where I, spent the fall of 2021 as an intern and I got to go on a night where we went solid owl banding and it was, it was a great night. I think we had 11 owls that night uh, that we got to catch and they're so small, but so feisty as you can see in this middle photo. And then I got, I got to help out with Mercy Mello on the, in the photo on the right. And she works with American Kestrels. She's a grad student that, was, that works at Hawk Mountain and she tags American Kestrels to try to learn more about them because they're a declining raptor species. So I spent a day working with Mercy and we caught a kestrel and put a little radio transmitter on it to hopefully track it and see how it does over the coming years. And then like, as you can see from the slide, I was burnt out from birding. I spent basically every day in Cape May birding. And over that short, it's about nine weeks or so, I think I had 235 species just in that county of Cape May. So. It was a lot of birding. I saw birds all day in the morning, some bird birding at night, and I needed a break. So I'm a big soccer fan. That's also something that I'm really into. So I regularly watch the English Premier League, and I was excited to watch the World Cup. So I spent time just chilling at home, resting, and watching soccer. And then after that, it came to December, and that is when Christmas bird count seasons in mid-December starts. And Christmas bird counts have been going on for a long time and they're con they're conducted across the U.S. and you go out to a certain area and try to count 
and make a general census of all the birds seen in that area. So we have this island off the Georgia coast called St. Catherine's Island. It's a private island, but um, they allow researchers to come out and birders to do uh, Christmas counts and migration counts. And so I've been going to the St. Catherine's count for a couple of years. And it was cool to see everyone. And they had, they actually have ring-tailed lemurs on the island. So we saw them on this visit, which was fun. It's kind of wild to see this Madagascar le lemur living on an island off the Georgia coast, but they're doing well there. And they all have radio collars and are monitored by the island staff. And then after that trip ended, I had one final trip that I wanted to make, uh, which was Mexico. And so I did this trip with my Georgia young birding friends. And I didn't see a familiar, a couple of familiar faces is John Mark Simmons, who I did the big day with and Kim Risen of Naturescape Tours, who has been leading Oaxaca tours for a long time. And he helped us out with our guide for this tour. And so it was about a 10 day trip right at the end of the year, see if I could squeeze out a few more species. Uh, visit a new site. So I went to Oaxaca and Chiapas, Mexico, which is known for its endemics. And they've got a bunch of incredible species down there. There was only, I only had about three days left in the year. I think I left on the 28th. So about three days of birding to see if how many species I could get. Cause I'd set a goal to try to see a thousand species uh, last year. And so we start off the morning of our first day near Mex north of Mexico City in the mountains, looking at Sierra Madre sparrows, which are rare relative to the song sparrow and, and striped sparrows, this bottom bird. And there are lots of gray silky flycatchers in large flocks, which you can see here. There's a closer photo on the left, uh, which are really neat birds down there. And then you have just a variety of cool habitats in this part of the world. Like I, I really enjoyed birding in Oaxaca and would love to return. There's so many cool birds and habitats. Uh, and there's a species of gray barn wren, which is a relative of the cactus wren, but they actually feed in the treetops, which is really unusual and fun to see. Like it's totally mind boggling to have a cactus wren relative up there. And then there's of course, like one of the main uh, endemics down there that birders want to see in Mexico is the red warbler. And I was able to see and get nice photos of this bird. And then on December 31st, we saw, we went to the Yagua archaeological site, uh, which is a Native American site where they had a whole civilization and had large temples and buildings. And we did some birding around there. And also we wanted to learn about the history. It wasn't totally birding trip. We also went to a mescal distillery and stuff like that. But it was really cool to learn about the culture from the inhabitants here from several thousand years ago. And so here are the final stats from the year. I didn't actually make it, unfortunately, to my goal of a thousand species. I ended up with about 935, according to eBird. And I, if you look here on the left, you can see the milestone year birds. They're approximate birds because when I was in a place like Ecuador, where I was seeing tons of lifers in a day, uh, based on eBird's list, it's going to be different than what it actually is. So you can see here, there's those milestone birds. I had about 400 species when I was in Ecuador, a little over 400 in those three months. And then American species for the next 400. And then down in Mexico, where I added the last 100 or so. And so I birded in, as I mentioned before, the US, Ecuador, and Mexico, and then 15 different states. And if you look at the right for my eBird usage, you can see the big spike in 2022 with the number of species I've seen um, last year. So I, yeah, at the end of 2022, I had 1760 was my life list and I got 443 lifers of those 935 species. So almost half of the species I saw were lifers. And so, yeah, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone that I was able to bird with that made the year possible, like Kim Rising with Naturescape and other birders that I met along the way or friends that I joined. And especially my mom, uh, Chris Biscard. She's the one that got me into birding uh, and started me on this path. And yeah, super grateful to her for getting me out there and encouraging me and doing all that. So I've went Happy New Year, everyone. It's dark because it's still before sunrise. And I'm out here with 
a flock of gray-breasted martins. Oh shit. They just flushed off the wires. But that's the first bird of 2023. And yeah, that's that's about it. So I ended the year with still in Mexico. I had a few more birds uh, that I didn't talk about because they, they weren't seen last year. But yeah, it was a great it was a great time, a great trip in Mexico. And if you have any questions, we can talk about that as at, at the end. But I also wanted to leave the screen up for folks that wanted to find me. I'm active on social media. If the main the main accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok and you can email me as well if you have any birding questions as well. So now I'll stop sharing and we can have questions, discussion for those that are interested. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was incredible. Um, I, I saw so many just in the chat, so many different versions of wow, great shot, beautiful picture, all that kind of stuff. So tons of compliments on the pictures all throughout. Um, uh, personally, I... I think my favorites are, I always love seeing the, the tanagers down in the tropics. Um, they're so colorful. And we don't get them here. But I also, I really think my favorite of the, the presentation was the Merlin um, with the food and its crop and the, and the, the dragonfly. That was a really awesome shot. So that was so cool. Um, I do have a question. Um, so Tom in Tucson asked, um, and this is understanding, of course, that different weather conditions and lighting conditions are going to change this, but just kind of on an average day, um, what is your kind of go-to camera setup when you're when you're going out to photograph birds? Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Tom. So I really like shooting um, aperture priority when I take photos because usually when I'm out birding, you know, birds are going to be in the treetops or down below or something. So instead of shooting manual and just constantly adjusting the shutter speed and like making sure to check. So my camera is a DSLR. So it's not like the new mirrorless where you can see what, what photo your photo will look like in the viewfinder. So I have to manually adjust it and like hope that the photo turns out well. So aperture priority I like is because when you take the photo, usually uh, it will usually properly expose it if it's at a lower altitude or elevation of the bird. And if the bird is high up in a tree um, and the sky is dark, I might manually up the exposure a couple stops or so just to get that in. But yeah, I shoot aperture priority and I have a Nikon uh, D810 with a 200 to 500 millimeter lens. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, that was what I had in the chat. If anybody has a question they'd like to ask Patrick themselves, um, you can go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask that question. So we'll, I'll kind of be quiet for half a second if anybody would like to ask a question. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say amazing photos and thank you for sharing your amazing adventures. Oh, thank you, uh, Anu, appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Anu, that's so nice. Um, and then, yeah, so if, if there are any questions, um, I always like to end the presentation by asking everyone to unmute themselves um, and just tell Patrick how much we appreciate his time. Like I said, these photos were beautiful. I learned a lot. Um, going the, the Alaskan pictures, they look cold and they look dreary, but I'm sure the birds were incredible. So like I said, at this time, I really uh, like it if people would just unmute themselves, give a quick thank you. Um, and then as we're doing that, just want to remind everybody, if you had to step away or if you joined us late, um, I will have this uploaded onto our YouTube channel uh, by the end of the day, and I will also send out a recap email to everyone that registered, and that email will contain that link, and you so you can just click on it to go that way as well. So with that, uh, like I said, I'd like to thank Patrick, um, as well as Gary Farber from Hunt's Photo. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, um, you know, and again, thank you for furthering our mission here at Tucson Audubon, which is to inspire people to enjoy and protect birds. Um, so that's all we've got today. And so, like I said, thank you, Patrick. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Wonderful and day. To the quiz. Quiz yeah. answers. Quiz answers. What happened to oh, that? Yeah. Great presentation, oh, yeah. Patrick. So <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. I actually I do what, have a question. I was wondering, Patrick, how you got out to the dry tortugas. What's that process? So they have a like it's a national park service site. So there's a there's a website on the Ferris on the website. I think it's like the Yankee, Yankee Freedom. Um, it's all online, but you have to oh. reserve it really far in advance because 
there's high demand and limited number of spots. Okay. But if you Google like visiting Tri Tortugas, um, and I did a day trip. The only downside to day trips is that it takes a long time to get out there and you're not out there very long. So it's recommended to do camping if you're interested in that. But uh, we saw everything that we wanted to see in a day. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I think that's all the questions we have. Um, so again, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you, Patrick. And everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye-bye.